you will, take your Bibles or your cell phone, whatever you use. We're going to continue our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You see the title of the message. How many of you have difficulty with the problem of pride? Just three of us, all right. So I'm going to be talking to us three mostly. No, primarily I'm going to speak to those of you that did not raise your hands because you were too proud to do so. Because we all wrestle with pride at some point. Now, nothing holds back revival more than does pride. I think nothing keeps some people from being saved more than pride. Uh, they refuse to humble themselves before God and be saved. It's a very deceptive sin. Pride is very deceptive. Uh, very few people will admit they've got a problem with that. I've told you before, I've, I've got several preacher uncles, only one still alive, and the Uncle Paul was always joking about wanting to write a book on how I became humble. And he said, the first 30 pages will be pictures of me. Of course, he's joking that a humble person doesn't know they're humble. Right? Uh, they might even be surprised if somebody would say that. But we're going to notice here in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul refers to these people in, in the Corinthian church as being puffed up. You see that in verse 6. You see it again in verse 19. And then in the next chapter, verse 2. Ye are puffed up. And that deals with pride. Puffed up with pride. With their own self-importance. And as we read this, I want you to note the irony and the sarcasm that Paul uses in dealing with this church in Corinth. He's rebuking their puffed up pride. Their self-sufficiency, their attitude that, that they have arrived, even more so than maybe the apostles. So you'll see that as we read this together. We're going to read the first 13 verses here in chapter 4, and I want you to notice the problem here in this church that Paul is trying to bring out. Verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yet I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. He judges all of us, amen. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? What hast thou that didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? as if thou hadst not received it. Now ye are full, there's some sarcasm, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us. I would to God ye did reign, that we might also reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. We're made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. 
and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world. He's talking here about the apostles. We are made the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. But here he's talking to these Corinthians and he's rebuking them for being puffed up for the pride that is there among them. He contrasts their illusions of having arrived with the reality of his own humble lifestyle. He talks about the apostles being made a spectacle for their benefit. He wants them to see how the apostles respond to adversity is how these Corinthians need to learn to fight the adversity that comes to them. I want to talk to you today about pride, the peril of pride. Let, let me preface this by first saying what pride is not. Good self-esteem is not pride. What do I mean by that? You are a child of God. You ought to understand it. You ought to realize who you are and to whom you belong. And that's important for us to understand. And there's, there's a sense of gratefulness that it's not pride. We can be grateful for one another. I can be proud of this church. I can be proud to be your pastor. I can be proud of you. And that's not the kind of pride we're talking about here. There is an idea of vain pride, that boastfulness that God is talking about here. I can be proud of my wife, and I can give honor unto her. And there's nothing wrong with receiving honor with the right attitude. What does the Bible say? Give honor unto honor is due. And we can receive that. I, I remember an old couple that was sitting on the porch and been married many, many years. And he looked at her with great affection, thought about how much he loved her. And he said to her, honey, I'm proud of you. But she was hard of hearing. She couldn't hear. She said, what? He said, I'm proud of you. She said, speak up. What would you say? He said, I am proud of you. She said, yeah, and I'm tired of you too. <laughs> they don't go to our church. It's a... Uh, but there's nothing wrong with taking pride in your family, taking pride in your work. I think you ought to do the best job you can do. I think you can, you can take pride in doing a job well. Hey, there's no virtue in being lazy. There's no virtue in, in being sloppy in your work. Yet the pride that God condemns here is that attitude of independence from God. As though we don't need God. A lot of people are that way, you know. Uh, I don't need God. I can do this myself. I'm the captain of my soul. I'm the master of my fate. A lot of people are that way today. They want to measure themselves by others and esteem themselves better. Hey, does it irritate you when somebody wants to correct your faults? Amen? Nod your head. It irritates you. I can tell. Pride says don't nod your head. <laughs> don't let anybody know it. It irritates you. But you ever find yourself accepting praise for something that you didn't do? Folks, listen. A lot of what we're able to do is to the glory of God. And we need to transfer. We need to give that praise. We need to pass it on to God instead of accepting it for ourselves. Let me give you five reasons why God hates this vain, egotistical pride which was prevalent in this church in Corinth. You want to take notes, first of all, pride provokes deity. Pride provokes deity. Over in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, 
you have a list of things that God hates. And the number one thing he lists is a proud look. God hates a proud look. You know, some people, they can strut sitting down. Try that, see. They can strut sitting down. You know, the Bible says that pride is abominable to God. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. God hates pride. Now you say, well, why does God hate pride so much? Think about what pride has done. And you'll understand this. Go all the way back to Lucifer. Lucifer, one of the archangels of God, was lifted up in pride, and it was pride that made him the devil. That was the first sin that we have recorded. Satan was full of wisdom and beauty. He, he was called Lucifer, which means light bearer. The Bible said he was perfect in all his ways until pride was found in him. And he wanted to lift himself up to be equal with God. God hates pride. Paul warns preachers about this. Not to be lifted up in pride unless he fall into the condemnation of the devil. That's in 1 Timothy 3, 6. Pride is what corrupted and condemned Lucifer. And we need to be careful about this. Go back to Adam and Eve. What was the sin of Eve? It was pride. Remember, the devil said, if you eat of this forbidden fruit, you shall be like God. So it was pride that caused Eve to take of the forbidden fruit to be, it was the same sin Lucifer committed. Eve wanted to be like God. And it was pride that brought sin into this world. That's why God hates it. Pride was the original sin. If there had been no pride, there would be no devil. If there was no fall, there would be no sin. God hates pride because of all that it's done to defile his creation. That's why God says in 1 Peter 5, 5, I will resist the proud and give grace to the humble. Now that is the main thought I want you to take home today. God will resist the proud, but he'll give grace to the humble. We need to learn how to humble ourselves before God. Secondly, pride proves depravity. Note how the depraved heart is manifested here. Sometimes people don't think that they're sinners because they don't cuss or drink or steal or any of these things. And yet there's vain pride in their heart. The Bible says in, in Proverbs 16, 5, about those proud in heart. Proud in heart. Proverbs 21, 4, and a high look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. You ever wonder what he means? The plowing of the wicked is sin. Just, just out plowing a field and sinning. Now, it's not a sin to plow a field, is it? Unless you had to do it, you might have thought it was. But it's not. But notice, it's the plowing of the wicked. Here's a man who's just plowing a field, but he's doing it in unbelief. He's doing it, rejecting what God has given him, thinking that this is all his doing. He forgets about the rain and sunshine that God gives. He forgets about the good soil. He forgets about the strength that God gives him to do this work. And just plowing a field, he does it in unbelief and in pride, and it's a sin. Anything you do that way is a sin. Not just plowing a field, driving a truck, or, or building a house, or whatever. I think the greatest need for a lot of people is to see their need. We need God. It's that pride in the heart that proves depravity. And secondly, note how the depraved heart is manufactured. Say, so Brother West, how does depravity get into the heart? Was born there. You were born a sinner. 
with the sin nature. How does a wormhole get into an apple? You ever get an apple and you see that wormhole there? Does that mean that there's a worm in the apple? Do like this. There's not a worm in the apple. The hole shows the worm got out of the apple. See, what happened is that that egg was laid in the apple blossom. When it became an apple, the worm was hatched and ate its way out of the apple. It was born in there. And folks, sin was born in our hearts. We're born with a sin nature. Just so the pride in your heart was born there. Hey, it came as standard equipment. When you came into this world, we all have this depraved heart. Go to Mark chapter 7. Let me show you what Jesus says about this. Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse number 20. And Jesus said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. That's what comes out of the heart of man by nature. As the descendants of Adam, we were all born sinners. And that false pride has just been passed on from generation to generation. We are self-centered by nature. You even see that in little children, don't you? I mean, you can tell they're little sinners, can't you? I mean, children naturally are selfish. I mean, it just comes naturally. You have to teach them how to share. Why do they fight over the toys? Who taught them to do that? comes natural. It's in their nature to be selfish and to, to sin. <laughs> now you may say, well, Brother West, I just don't swallow that total depravity doctrine. You don't have to. It's already in you. Amen. It was born there, whether you swallow it or not. Pride proves depravity. Number three, pride promotes dissension. We see that was a real problem in this Corinthian church. There was a lot of division, strife, dissension. And among the things that God hates is also the sowing of discord. God hates those who cause division in the church. Proverbs 13, 10 says, Only by pride cometh contention. Notice that. Only by pride cometh contention. All wars, all fights, all dissension are rooted in pride. There's never been a church split that pride was not a factor. The Corinthian church was divided because of this puffed up pride. I'll tell you, Satan would rather tear up a church than build a casino. Amen. Amen. And he will use prideful church members to do it. We need humble members who will be faithful in doing their share of the work, not to be praised, but to the glory of God. Brother Sam, I read a story the other day about a choir director who was working with his choir, preparing a cantata. He is very frustrated that his choir members kept missing rehearsals. Every rehearsal, uh, there would be somebody missing. Finally, after the last rehearsal, he said, I want to personally thank our pianist for being the only one in this choir to attend every rehearsal for the last two months. He's wanting to shame the rest of them, praise the pianist. But she said, well, you know, it's the least I could do since I won't be here for the cantata. Amen. Not only you see what pride will do to a church, what will pride do to a marriage? 
you got a husband and a wife. There's never been a divorce that pride was not a factor. Pride keeps people from solving their problems. Amen. Hey, there's no problems too big to solve. Only people too small to solve them. Husbands and wives will attack one another instead of attacking the problem. It's ego against ego. When you have two people filled with pride and self-centeredness, you're going to have problems. When one wants his or her way about everything, you got a house divided which Jesus says cannot stand. Instead of Christ being on the throne of your life, you may be on the throne. See, you've got to get off the throne so Christ can sit on it. So he can be truly the Lord of your life and of your family. When self is on the throne, Christ is still on the cross. When Christ is on the throne in your life, then you're on the cross, living a sacrificial life. Fourthly, I want you to see pride produces dishonor. Pride produces dishonor. I want you to note the basic premise here. The proud person wants the acclaim of others. Now, I say there's nothing wrong with being honored if you have received honor where honor is due. But those who want to be honored so much and seek it are the ones who will ultimately lose it. Write this verse down, Proverbs 11 2. You notice a lot of Proverbs deal with this. Proverbs 11 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Let's so look at this. Before honor is humility, before shame is pride. Pride produces dishonor. Solomon also said in Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. We'll give you one more. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. See how often this is mentioned? Folks, this is very important to God. That we be a humble people, not full of pride, always wanting to exalt ourselves. So many are conceited. Hey, folks, conceit is a disease that makes everybody sick except the person that has it. Exalting oneself. Constantly promoting oneself. Pride and conceit will bring shame. Folks, not honor. Years ago, there was an Olympian by the name of Ben Johnson. You might say y'all might remember Ben Johnson won the gold medal in the Olympics. He was exalted and honored when he returned home, had parades in his honor. But then the truth came out. He had been taking drugs to enhance his performance. All of a sudden, that honor turned to shame. And a whole nation was ashamed of him. The very thing he wanted, he lost. Is that, is that the way it is? We're trying to seek this for ourselves. Now I want you to note the Bible principle here. This is what I want you to take home with you today. There's a Bible principle stated often here in the scriptures. Jesus said it in Luke 14, 11. Whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, brought down. And he that humbles himself shall be exalted. It's stated again in 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Peter said, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Don't exalt yourself, let God do that at the proper time. Let God exalt you. Now think again about Lucifer. Lucifer exalted himself. He wanted to be the highest. He was cast out of heaven, and one day he's going to be cast into hell. 
to the lowest parts of hell. Isaiah says that he will be on exhibit. You know that? Go to Isaiah 14. Very interesting thought here about what's going to happen to Satan someday. In Isaiah 14, look at verse 12. It says there, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's talking about the other angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's what he thought. Look what happens. Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Now look at this. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, and open not the house of his prisoner. The thought here is, here is Satan who is cast down to hell to the lowest parts of hell, and he's going to be on exhibit. We will be able to look at him. He's not going to reign over hell, by the way. Satan's not the king of hell. He's going to be sent there to suffer, to be punished more than anybody else. He will be the lowest. He'll be like a worm crawling around in the ashes and people will look at him and say are you kidding that is him that is the devil the God of this world look what happened to him he that wanted to exalt himself God is going to abase to the lowest parts of hell it's kind of interesting isn't it People look down into the pit and see the devil squirming like a worm in shame and humiliation. He wanted to be like the Most High in his pride, but he was a base more than any creature. Now contrast that with the Lord Jesus Christ. He who exalts himself shall be a base. That's the devil. He who humbles himself shall be exalted. That's Jesus. How did Jesus do that? He left the glories of heaven. He became our brother in the flesh. He went to the cross and died for our sins, suffering the most humiliating of all deaths. He humbled himself. Now what's happened? He has been highly exalted. He is given a name above all names. Write this verse down in your notes. Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11. There it says, He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Then wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name that's above every name. But at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's two paths set before us, folks. There's a way of pride and humiliation, and there's a way of humility and exaltation. Exalt yourself now and be abased, or humble yourself now and one day be exalted. See, the way up is down. First, you've got to get down on your knees. Humble yourself before God. Confess your sinfulness and seek His forgiveness. He will lift you up. Set you upon a rock. Amen. And the final thought is this. Pride precedes destruction. Y'all listen to me over here. Hey. Listen to me. What I got to say is important. Pride 
pride precedes destruction. Give me some more Proverbs here. Proverbs 15, 25. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 18, 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty and before honor is humility. Vain pride produces ruin. It brings national ruin to a nation. A nation that is puffed up with pride, God can bring down. It brings emotional ruin and abasement, shame and dishonor. And it brings financial ruin. Many people are in financial difficulties today because of their pride. They buy things they don't need with money they don't have to impress people they don't even like. Amen. We stay in trouble financially because our neighbors keep buying things we can't afford. Think about that. Trying to keep up with the Joneses. But folks, most of all, pride brings eternal ruin. Millions have died and gone to hell because their pride would not allow them to humble themselves before God. They could not acknowledge their need for salvation, their need for a Savior. Vain pride will not let you walk down this aisle. Pride keeps many of you from doing it. Vain pride. You will not humble yourself before God. One day you will. You may be concerned about your dignity more so than, keep, than seeking the forgiveness of God. That's pride. Some have so much pride they will not confess their sin. Hey, that's why salvation by works is preferred by most people. Hey, salvation by works lets you keep your pride. Right? Let you keep your pride. That's why most people will go that route. But salvation by grace through faith calls us to humble ourselves and confess our sin. You may have too much pride to come humble yourself before God. But I will guarantee you one day you will. Maybe not in this life, but in the life to come, every knee shall bow. The knee of the atheist shall bow. The knee of the humanist shall bow. The knee of the Muslim shall bow to the Lord Jesus Christ, not to Muhammad. There's coming a day. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Now here's the thing. It's better to do that now by your own volition than to have to do it then. Because I guarantee you, lost friend, when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory and majesty, you will automatically hit your knees. You won't give it a second thought. You will bow. You can do it now to the salvation of your soul. Or you can wait till then when it won't save you. It'll be too late then. You'll be cast into hell to spend eternity with Satan. How about it today? As Brother Sam comes, our musician, we prepare for this invitation hymn. Please don't wait till it's too late. Don't put off something as important as your salvation. If you're not saved and you need Christ in your life, we encourage you, we invite you and exhort you to come today. Bow your knee to Christ and trust in him as your Lord and Savior. One day, he will exalt you. But if you are exalted in pride, all you've got to look forward to one day is to be brought down. 